Welcome to the fifth lecture of the course Reinforcement Learning at Paderborn University. My name is Oliver Waldscheid and today we are going to extend the episodic methods we have learned last week under the term Monte Carlo methods for reinforcement learning in a control and prediction scenarios to online capable step-by-step -step procedures which we call temporal, temporal difference learning. Temporal difference learning or short TD nicely combines the two main solution methods in MDPs which we already discussed. It will be on the one hand the already mentioned Monte Carlo methods. So we will learn from experience, so from a data-based feedback of our uh, interaction with the environment. And from dynamic programming, we will use the idea of updating estimates based on other estimates, which we have called bootstrapping. So if we summarize then the TD characteristics, it is a model-free uh, prediction and control method in unknown MDP. So this is uh, inherent uh, from uh, the Monte Carlo idea using sample-based feedback. We will update our policy uh, evaluation and improvement steps in an online fashion so we don't have to wait until an episode has uh, terminated by the bootstrapping techniques of dynamic programming. However, um, as we also did this in a Monte Carlo approach, we will still assume that the problem we are facing has a finite MDP form and therefore uh, some of the proofs and some of the theoretical conclusions we have drawn from dynamic programming in terms of bias-free predictions or also optimal policies uh, will apply. Based on this little preface on a temporal difference and the correlation or in its you know, contrast to uh, Monte Carlo methods and dynamic programming, the agenda for this lecture is structured as here. So classically, as also in the last weeks, we will start with a prediction task using here temporal difference in this case. Then for control, we will separate our analysis in twofold. First, we will do online policy control, which is called SASAR for temporal difference. And then we will extend that to off policy control, which we will use, uh, which we will call Q-learning. Then expected SASAR is a small but useful extension to the uh, SASAR control. And then we will handle the so-called maximization bias and uh, we'll try to solve this maximization bias uh, with the so-called double learning approach. But first let's start with temporal difference prediction or baseline problem. So from Monte Carlo we will just very quick recap that. We know that in the every visit case of Monte Carlo we can update our state value estimate by using the previous state estimate of this specific state and then correct it by this difference here. So what we get is our sampled return from our complete episode. So here under Monte Carlo assumptions and we subtract that from our current estimate of that state. And this difference is then added to the current estimate together with that forgetting factor also called step size alpha. And this was then the incremental update rule. And in terms of this update rule, we can call this sampled return as our target. So in a steady state, if we have gathered enough samples uh, in the uh, Monte Carlo fashion, then we will find out that in average, our uh, state estimate or state value estimate will become our averaged return from our sampled series. And yeah, so very important. Just to stress that again, so under Monte Carlo approach, we really have to wait until the episode has ended because otherwise we don't get that target here, right? So we don't get the return before the episode is really terminated. And now in contrast to this episode by episode uh, update rule, we will use a slightly different target using bootstrapping for temporal difference learning. And this solution is shown here in equation 5.2 and we call that update rule the one step temporal difference or also sometimes called TD0 approach. We will see in subsequent lectures, not today, that there are also modified 
temporal difference approaches, so that's why it's called one step. There are also multi step approaches, but we will take that into account later. So, what is the big difference here between um, Monte Carlo and temporal difference updates? It is the target. So, basically, here the sampled return is now exchanged, is now modified in the TD case for this bootstrapping target. So, the bootstrapping target is here again that we will take the uh, instantaneous reward so this is sampled so this is the let's say real feedback the instantaneous feedback we have received from our environment plus the discounted so using the Bellman equation plus the discounted state value of the successor state xk plus one and this update rule of course is then again bootstrapping because we update the estimate of the state value of state xk based on its successor state. So here we have again this bootstrapping idea which we have learned in dynamic programming. The nice thing is now that we don't have to wait anymore for the entire episode to be terminated but we just have to wait until we have finished this one simple state transition. So when we went from xk to xk plus one we can look in our tables in our memory where we have stored the different state value estimates at a certain time at a certain uh, step number and then can use that available estimate there in order to update our state value of the previous state xk so we only have a one step delay update the implementation of the temporal difference based prediction is also very straightforward so what do we need again? As we do prediction, we need a policy which will be evaluated. We want to get the estimates of all states, uh, the state values, and we need again an initialization for the state values uh, with the boundary condition that again any terminal state has to be set zero and very often also the other state values are set to zero as well. And then we run a couple of episodes initialize uh, our state randomly or due to some a rule and then we run uh, our steps per episode and now this is like the difference in terms of temporal difference uh, compared to Monte Carlo we can do the updates with every time step so in every time step k we will apply an action from our current policy which we want to evaluate we observe as direct feedback the state transition to xk plus one the reward we receive from the environment and then we will evaluate the one step dd rule from the previous slide so we will update our state estimate and rerun this entire loop until that a certain successor state xk plus one is terminal and then we will loop until the next episode nice thing here is that the exact same methodology can be also adapted to action values in this case we just have to take into account the state action pairs for the updates but the uh, rest of the algorithm can be straightforwardly transferred also to the action value uh, prediction case we can then discuss a little bit the so-called uh, dt error so what is our estimation error basically and therefore we first have to uh, recap that uh, temporal difference as well as Monte Carlo updates are sample updates so we take only sampled data from the environment we don't apply any knowledge here of our MDP so we are just working with data and yeah looking ahead to sample successor state including its value and the reward along the way the uh, yeah backed up value estimate is corrected and in this case, or in this TD framework, we can just define, so this is a straightforward definition, uh, which follows from the TD0 update, this TD error, which we will call delta k. And this uh, TD error is basically here our target, uh, which we had in TD0, so this was our bootstrapped target, minus the current state value uh, of xk plus, uh, of xk, so basically this error here will then determine the change of the current state value. And in the long run, of course, uh, if we are converging to steady state, this error here, so uh, the two terms will be the same. And ideally then the TD error is zero. 
And now we can compare the TD error to the Monte Carlo case. And for the Monte Carlo case or for the TD case, we assume, so this is a simplified assumption, that an estimate uh, of a certain state uh, is not changing over one episode. So in this case, we can nicely compare to um, Monte Carlo prediction because there in Monte Carlo prediction, we would also, of course, have to wait until the episode has ended. Here on the left hand side of this equation, we just have the Monte Carlo error. So we have our Monte Carlo target minus the estimate of that state value. So this is directly translating from our definition of the TD error now to the Monte Carlo error. And then here on the right hand side, so this part here is again just the uh, Bellman or part of the uh, Bellman equation, of course. So the bootstrapped return is just the current reward plus a discounted return and then if we compare this part here so this is just basically summing up to zero and this part here of course is also cancelling out each other so basically what we uh, have here in that first equation is just the Monte Carlo um, the Bellman equation on the Monte Carlo case so we can then slightly rewrite the right hand side by um, yeah, taking into account that uh, then the um, discount factor here is uh, applying to these two terms to the state value of the successor state and the successor return. And, oh no, this is wrong. So this is not this one, that is this one. And uh, then these three terms here on the right hand side, so these together are again our TD error from the previous slide. So that's why we have here our TD error plus the discounted future return minus the successor state state value. Then we can again just simply rewrite uh, using the TD error this series again. So we can uh, rewrite it a little bit in that say, uh, sense that we have the TD error at time step k plus a discounted TD error at time step k plus 1 plus the discounted to the power of 2, future return minus the successor state value at xk plus 2, and so on and so on. And basically, if we rewrite it all the way along, then we will find that this Monte Carlo error, which we started here on the left-hand side, is perfectly our sum of the future discounted CD errors. So there's a direct link between the Monte Carlo error and the uh, sum of the TD errors. So of course, this is a simplified case because we have assumed that the uh, TD error is not changing over one full episode, but even if the state value is updated using the TD methodology, then we can say that uh, this uh, identity here, which I have sket sketched, is only uh, holding approximately. So we can find a nice connection here between the Monte Carlo estimation error uh, over time and the TD error. If we compare then our yeah, four solution techniques which we have discussed for solving MDPs, we can find out that we have basically two dimensions in order to compare them. The first dimension is the depth of the update and the second dimension is the width of the update. So with exhaustive search, which we have discussed in the terms of dynamic programming, we just take into account the entire state and action space. We take into account all possible trajectories, all possible combinations in order to solve an MDP problem. So this is full width and full length update. Then for dynamic programming, we just had these shallow updates. So one step update, so small in terms of the depth, but wide in terms of the update. So we took into account the entire MDP by using our model uh, knowledge and updated all possible transitions in a one-step manner. On the other side, last week, Monte Carlo, so we didn't take into account any width of the MDP, so we just sampled one specific trajectory, but from the beginning until the end. So a really a deep update. And today, and this is let's say, uh, the very nice uh, characteristic here of temporal difference, we are combining that uh, small width backup of Monte Carlo with the small length up update of dynamic programming. So only 
one step into the future without any uh, without any uh, width which we are using here. And after discussing the theoretical backgrounds of uh, Monte Carlo versus temporal difference learning, I would also illustrate the uh, methodology differences with that driving home example here. So the task is to estimate the amount of time which we will probably need being at a certain state. So state here can be interpreted at some location on our uh, way home uh, from the office. And yeah, so the estimation task, the state value would be then interpreted as the time we will probably need to arrive home. So the starting state is that we will leave the office and the initial guess would be 30 minutes. Then we are reach our car, it's raining, so the agent is estimating that due to the rain uh, we probably need a little bit more of time. Then we uh, drive through the highway and find out that we have uh, underestimated or overestimated the amount of time, therefore only need 35 minutes in our prediction and so on and so on. And uh, after 43 minutes in total we are arriving at home. If we compare then this update scenario for Monte Carlo here on the left and temporal difference on the right, we can uh, nicely illustrate the differences in the updates. So the Monte Carlo uh, update would take into account these Monte Carlo errors here in red uh, font or red color. So we will compare the actual outcome, so our 43 minutes, compared to the estimates per state. So leaving office state, reach the car and so on. And this would be the update after the episode has terminated. On the other hand, we have a temporal difference learning, which is using the bootstrapping idea. So here we don't compare our state estimates, state value estimates to the final outcome, but only to the next successor state value estimate. So this is here the idea of bootstrapping and therefore these um, TD arrows also here as red arrows are always uh, connecting the current state and the successor state. And by this, we can then, as we have already discussed, as a big difference, do also step-by-step -step updates in an online fashion here for the Monte Carlo um, estimation. We really need to arrive at home, then we can make our updates. But here with TD error, we could also try to make our estimates better along the way. Of course, a very nice feature then here also of temporal difference learning is that we can apply it to continuing tasks, for example, to engineering control task, where we are, don't have specific episodes, which we can, um, where we can wait until these episodes have terminated. The control has to run 24 seven all the time. And in this case, due to that step like procedure here, step like update procedure, temporal difference learning is nicely suited for continuing task where Monte Carlo is uh, not able to cover this type of reinforcement learning problems. And we can also apply temporal difference learning in that TD0 variant also to our well-known forestry MDP, again with our standard parameterization of uh, discount factor 0.8, disaster probability of 0.2. And we want to again predict the state values of these three states here for the 50-50 policy. And we have done this here on that slide for three different uh, learning rates or step sizes of the temporal difference algorithm. So that's why I have implemented here that uh, index of TD to denote, okay, this alpha is corresponding to temporal difference is not the alpha of the MDP, which we are considering here. And yeah, per row, we have the uh, estimates over a couple of episodes, again, the uh, red curve here is the mean over 2000 independent runs and the blue area is the standard deviation. And yeah, per row we have again the state value estimate of state one, state two, state three for three different uh, alphas of the TD learning algorithm. And I believe from this slide we can um, utilize two takeaway messages. The first takeaway message is that the larger we set alpha, the quicker we converge to our 
final value. So here for very slow or for very little alpha, we see that this convergence really takes some time. But on the other hand, and this is the second takeaway message, the uncertainty, so here the standard deviation is much smaller for these smaller learning rates as compared here to larger alphas in the TD context. So again, here we have a trade-off between fast exploration and accuracy. So if you're also looking here, it's, it's not visible so much, but maybe if you zoom in into your lecture slides, you will also recognize that there might be a small steady state error for alpha uh, equal 0.2, which is not the case if we uh, assume, uh, which is not very visible if you use that small alpha here and um, invest a lot of episodes. Here on this slide, pretty much the same as from the previous slide is shown. So we want to estimate again the state values of the forest tree MDP. However, now we are compared to Monte Carlo for different learning rates. And on the y-axis, you can see the uh, root mean squared error of the actual uh, state value from calculated from dynamic uh, programming, also from the real state value minus the estimate for all three states. So that's why we have uh, the average here of all three state values. And we will uh, sketch that over the number of episodes from zero episodes to up to 500 episodes. And the uh, continuous lines here, the full lines are corresponding to the Monte Carlo approaches and the dashed line are the temporal difference approaches for three different alphas, so 0 0.2, 0 0.1, and 0.05. And what we did here is we initialized all state values at zero. So as the yeah, let's say stone age default initialization. And therefore we start at rather high state value errors, RMS errors, and then everything is converging nicely. And from this diagram, um, the takeaway message is if we compare it over a num number of episodes, Temporal difference and Monte Carlo converges very similarly. We don't have any uh, big difference here if the entire uh, framework is the same. So uh, not the big deal in this scenario. However, if we uh, zoom in a little bit by resetting uh, that problem here, but we initialize our guesses a little bit better. So we initialize our guesses uh, of the state value v0 uh, roughly in the same area where the true values would lie to see how the um, yeah, results of Monte Carlo and temporal difference learnings are looking like if we are close to the uh, true value. Therefore here on the y-axis we see that we start with uh, much less error in terms of the RMS estimation error and now we can see that again, so for larger alpha factors, we can see that the learning is quicker. However, for Monte Carlo, we can observe that it's more stable. So here, the um, especially the dashed line for uh, temporal difference with a high learning step size of alpha, this is uh, not diverging. It seems to be still stable, but its performance is uh, getting poorer over time. And we can see that also for the other cases that in the long run, if you already start with a good initialization, that then Monte Carlo is a little bit uh, more stable and a little bit more accurate compared to temporal difference. So this bootstrapping here is obviously adding a little bit of variance, uh, which is not present or not present in that, that significance in the uh, Monte Carlo case. So that's maybe a good motivation also to have a look at this theorem here on the convergence proper properties of temporal difference learning. And the theorem states that for any fixed policy pi, we want to evaluate the state value estimates of the temporal difference learning uh, algorithm converges to the uh, true state value if the uh, mean for a constant but sufficiently small step size alpha so and in this case it's only converging in the mean and it's converging to the true state value even with probability one if the step size uh, alpha holds that condition 
and this is a um, yeah, very important convergence uh, condition which we will see throughout the entire lecture a couple of times that the step size if we take the infinite sum of the step size that should be infinite and if we take the infinite sum of the squared step size parameter then this should be less than infinite so this guy here should be bounded and the sum of the non-squared step sizes should be unbounded and uh, this convergence property for example holds for the case that we state alpha is 1 divided by k so in the first initial step alpha would be 1 for k equals 1 and then in the second step it would be 1 half and so on so this special case here is meeting the condition 5.5 so basically even in cases where we don't uh, use that particular uh, step size choice equation 5.5 can we again translate it to that exploration exploitation dilemma so in the first couple of episodes we may want to use larger alphas such that we can explore the state in action space sufficiently well and then for increasing number of steps we want to reduce our alpha parameter in order to more finely evaluate suitable estimates and also policies in the state in action space so this is again somehow similar to our discussion from last week on the choice of epsilon greedy factor so in practice um, there's also again some examples in the button sutton work which i didn't show you in particular we can see that the td is uh, converging a little bit faster but there's no guarantee we saw it in the um in the forestry mdp in this case so in this specific state action space uh, we saw that td and monte carlo really converge more or less in the same way but there are counter examples where uh, one can show that temporal difference can converge faster than monte carlo but in general it uh, depends on the application so there can be there's not really a general statement on that and there can be also the case um I didn't show that here but there can be also the problem that temporal difference learning is sensitive to bad initializations so if uh, v0 here is far far away from its true value then might be cases that uh, temporal difference learning really needs a lot of a lot of uh, steps a lot of episodes to reach the true value compared to monte carlo Yeah, another important aspect in Monte Carlo learning but also temporal difference learning and in general in reinforcement learning is the question uh, what do we do with limited experience so we have found theorems for Monte Carlo control if you remember the greedy in the limit theorem or now on the previous slide also for temporal difference that we need this infinite amount of experience sequences and this is of course a theoretically nice property that in the limit these algorithms will converge to the true state value and also will converge to the optimal policy but what do we do in practice so what do we do if the amount of experience is limited and in this case we can use the sample data which is available so we have here a set of sample data and we can try to reuse that sample data in order to converge a little bit faster and this is called batch training so we not only using the sample data once as we have discussed with the uh, monte carlo approaches from last week or also td0 as one of the previous slide there the classical um, denotation was okay we take one episode or one sequence we apply it once to the specific algorithms and that's it and then we throw it away however it may be useful to reapply it a couple of times until we uh, converge into some uh, steady state uh, in terms of in given databases right so we reapply this databases to temporal difference again and again and again until we see that for a given uh, alpha uh, corresponding to the theorem from the previous slide that the estimates converge to certain steady state values so this can help in order to squeeze out as much information as possible from a given data batch 
from a given reinforcement learning based data bench. And uh, I would like to highlight also the differences uh, in batch training uh, for Monte Carlo and simple difference learning in the following. And this can be nicely done by a very intuitive example uh, from Bato and Sutton, which I would like to call the AB example. So we have a very simple environment, only two states, state A and state B. If we are in state A, we will, with uh, probability one, transition to state B, and we don't get any reward for that. And then from state B, we have 75% probability to terminate the episode and along the way get a positive reward of plus one and 25% chance of terminating the reward without any, uh, terminating the episode without any positive reward. We don't apply any discounting here. And the question is, what is the estimate state value of state A and state B using batch learning? So this is our batch of examples which we have obtained from the environment using TD0 and MC. So we will compare that. We have eight samples available. Seven of these samples have started in state B and only one sample has stayed started in state A. And because there are so many samples for state B, we will uh, start with state B. Uh, and uh, before we do that, we will first recap the Monte Carlo and T uh, temporal difference learning algorithms again. So here again, the difference was only in the uh, return target and the bootstrap target of temporal difference. And as I have discussed before, the idea of batch learning is now to use that batch of data in order to squeeze out as much as information as possible and um, drive the estimation into steady state. And steady state, of course, means that this um, that update here in terms of the Monte Carlo update as well as the temporal difference update is not changing something with our estimates. So that would then the steady state. Yeah, we just uh, bring these update factors here to zero. We can rearrange. So in Monte Carlo case, the steady state update would be that G is equal the estimated uh, state value. And in temporal difference, we would have the instantaneous reward plus the discounted successor state value minus the current state value estimate. And if we do that over a sweep of uh, batches, so over a sweep of episodes, basically here we get the uh, Monte Carlo uh, solution again. So the sum of the sample returns and in temporal difference a little bit, uh, yeah, slightly different. We get again the sum of these bootstrapped update errors. So if we apply now this finding here, so this is the finding I'm talking about in steady state. We can now apply this finding first for the B state of our previous example and then for the A state. So let's stay, I'll start with the B state. So in the B state we had seven uh, different samples. And the nice thing is uh, since the B state doesn't have any successor, right? So the B state is uh, the real last state and uh, after that the episode is terminated. So we know that our successor state is not really existing, so therefore it's zero. And in this case, the TD error, the TD uh, error is uh, yeah, simplified to this equation here. And this is exactly the same as we have for Monte Carlo. So in this example here for the B state, the two uh, update rules in steady state converge to the same update rule. So basically just the average of the sampled returns. And for state B, uh, as I said, we have uh, seven, I know we have uh, yeah, seven uh, episodes which started in B, but in total eight episodes in terms of uh, episodes which have visited B. And there six times we got a positive reward of one, two times you get a po uh, we got a zero reward. And if we average that, then we will get that in the Monte Carlo case is equal to the temporal difference case. And we will get really the true value, which is 0.75. So 
Okay, that's nice. Cool. How can we translate that for the A case? And again, so we still assume a steady state of the batch learning process. And the transition from the A state to the B state was without reward. So the reward is zero for this transition. And uh, we know that for the for the TD update, we need the bootstrapped estimate of the successor state. And we have just calculated that on the previous slide so that successor state uh, estimate is three over four. Recap, so what was the steady state uh, update for Monte Carlo? Okay, just the sum of G minus V. So this is again here the uh, sum of the of the returns minus the estimate of VA. And now for temporal difference, we really have that uh, diff that yeah that difference in terms of Monte Carlo. If we plug in these values here, so return is zero, and what is left is then the sum of the discounted state values of the successor state. So this is here the successor state. Successor state would be B minus the uh, state value of its current state. So and if we then use these two equations and rearrange to the unknown VA, we will find that for uh, we will find that for uh, Monte Carlo uh, control this is zero. Why? Because we only had one episode for Monte Carlo control where the sampled return was zero. So we take this one sample return series of zero, plug it in, and we find out that using the batch learning Monte Carlo control giving us a state estimate of state A is zero. For temporal difference, however, we have non-discounted problems, so gamma here is one, and we are uh, from, from this equation find out that in this case the state value estimate of B is equal A. So this is basically stated here, and therefore the state steady state state value estimate in the temporal difference case for VA is three over four. So there is a distinct difference between the Monte Carlo case and the temporal difference case. And the question is where comes it comes from? So in the Monte Carlo case, basically what we are going to do is we want to minimize the least square fit. So we want to minimize this error here, right? So this is our TD error, uh, our Monte Carlo error. So uh, if we do that for a couple of uh, episodes, then it uh, and for all uh, states inside the state space, then uh, minimizing this least square uh, metric here will uh, give us then the information about how the Monte Carlo learning approach is converging. However, and this is a great difference now to the uh, t uh, temporal difference batch learning. The temporal difference batch learning is conversion to the maximum likelihood estimate because we are using bootstrapping, right? So in the temporal difference learning case, we are using our estimated knowledge about our model we are interacting with, our environment we are interacting with. So we have this tuple here of state states, actions, state transition probabilities, reward function, and gamma, which is not known to temporal difference learning in terms of perfect knowledge, but temporal difference learning is applying the, the data it already has in that sense that it assumes that that information with its, which it maps to that MDP structure here is 100% 100% perfectly fitting the real world. And this is done by the bootstrapping idea that we estimate estimates on the basis of other estimates. So we have now really broadly discussed the prediction case of temporal difference learning compared to Monte Carlo. But of course, we only want uh, we also wa want to use uh, temporal difference in terms of control, and we will start with the on policy case, which is called Zaza. And the off pol in the on policy case, basically uh, what we have discussed for DP and Monte Carlo, the general, uh, the generalized policy iteration. So the sequential change of 
policy evaluation and policy improvement also will be used in the direct fashion for temporal difference control. And we call this one step TD action value update, ZASA, because we are taking into account a state action reward next state next action tuple. So here we are starting from our current action, uh, current state, current action. So that would be that state action. We receive an instantaneous reward and then our transition to the next state and the action in that next state is then completing our tuple, which we need in order to find this TD update. So basically uh, what we do here is uh, using temporal difference, not on a state value basis, but on an action value basis. And that action value basis can be then used again in an on policy uh, manner in order to find optimal or near optimal decisions. Yeah, in contrast again to Monte Carlo, we can do that SASA updates on the state, uh, on the action values in a continuous fashion. So we can do it step by step and we don't have to wait until the end of an episode. And as discussed, on policy approach requires us to perform sufficient exploration. And the standard case, as we have learned last week, could be epsilon greedy policy. So we will uh, evaluate that action value here, action value estimate, and then apply an epsilon greedy strategy that all non greedy actions can also. Uh, so that is basically then also on policy ZADA, on policy temporal difference control, very straightforward. And we can directly state, we can directly give the temporal difference based on policy control implementation, uh, which is stated here. So we have now two hyperparameters of these algorithms, which is our step size of the uh, action value learning and our epsilon greedy parameter in order to ensure sufficient exploration. We will start again with an arbitrarily initialized uh, Q estimate and we will gather our experience uh, over different episodes. Would be also a continuous way, then uh, this number of episodes would be of course one. We will somehow initialize our states. We will choose an initial action from a soft policy, for example, epsilon greedy, and then we uh, will repeat inside this episode, so we will take a multitude of steps until the episode is terminated. So we will take an we will take that action and we will observe the feedback we get from the environment, in particular the reward and the successor state. And because we need that tuple of state, next state, reward, action, and next action, we have to plug in now the successor state in our uh, state uh, action value estimate in order to find also the next state. So that's an additional step we don't have in uh, TD0 control for state values, but now for action values. And then we have these information. So we have the information about the successor state from deriving a policy from our uh, current action value. We can also derive our next state value and then perform our action value update based on the uh, SASA rule from the previous slide. And nice thing is we can uh, summarize that the convergence properties are comparable to uh, Monte Carlo based on policy control. So the policy improvement theorem holds, uh, and especially here the uh, Glee arguments, so greedy and the limit with infinite exploration. So if we apply an adaptive change of alpha in terms of the TD error and epsilon in terms of the exploration and apply an infinite number of steps, then we can state that on policy control will in the limit converge to the optimal policy with perfect estimation of the action values of that optimal policy. However, again, this is more or less an academic statement because we cannot really apply an infinite number of steps or episodes. Yeah, let's see some uh, examples. Uh, one classical example for Zada is the so-called Winnie grid word example. So what is the task here? We start in some starting grid. So this would be the starting position and we want to reach that goal. 
However, as the name already says, we have some side wind coming from south to north. And these numbers here are beneath the, underneath the uh, grid world environment will give us the strength of that wind. So if I'm staying here on that position uh, in the next step, I will be shifted by two steps to the north. So this is basically the yeah, information here and the states are bounded. So if I'm here and the wind pushes me more to the north direction, I will be bounded here so I don't fly off the grid. And the mini grid world rules are that, yeah, we want to reach that goal state here as quick as possible. So we get a reward of minus one. We don't apply any discounting. The wind I've already discussed. And for this uh, performance, we can see here the other performance. It was assumed that epsilon is 0.1, alpha is uh, 0.5, and we initialize all state value estimates by zero. And this yeah, learning curve, which is sketched here, gives us also the information that here we have after yeah, maybe six, 7,000 steps, that this time steps per episode factor, this steepness here is more or less constant. So we will have found the optimal policy in this case, which is also sketched here as a blue line. So we want to uh, quickly go to the goal state, then we will let us drift to the northern rim here of that uh, windy grid world environment as we are not pushed out of the uh, grid world we can wait until we have traveled into that corner here where we don't have any north south wind anymore then we will travel down and yeah reach the goal state from behind uh, in this case sasa really works well and maybe also a question for you as a yeah, homework question more or less, you can maybe think of that. So why could here Monte Carlo control have a problem? So what could be maybe the critical situation in Monte Carlo, which we don't have with, or which we don't likely have with Sasa? Yeah, we've also applied Sasa to our first three MDP. Again here, first row are the action value estimates of first state and the waiting action and we have also the um, policy in terms of a uh, stochastic policy and we will pick here the uh, Zaza base control for Zaza uh, alpha factor of 0.2 and epsilon greedy of 0.2 as well and again we have the means in red and the uncertainty in terms of standard deviation over 2000 independent runs in light blue and what we can see here that we really have uh, some uncertainty. So we really need a couple of steps. So here this is uh, to the power of four. So we have uh, 10,000, 20,000 steps which we apply. And there is still some uncertainty here due to we have a fixed step size which is fixed all the time and not changed over time. And also epsilon greedy is fixed uh, all over the time. So here for the action values, the uncertainty is, yeah, not too big, a little bit, but still visible. But here, especially for the uh, best actions, we really have a problem. Uh, we cannot really find the optimal policy, which becomes uh, especially evident here for the starting state. Uh, if you remember, the optimal policy in the starting state would be to wait. However, with Zaza in this configuration, we roughly get 50% probability. So we stay with a 50-50 policy and we cannot really find the optimal uh, policy here. If we change a little bit our uh, implementation to alpha 0.1, so our um, our updates are uh, not as fast, but in the long run more accurate, we can observe two things. The one thing is that especially here the action value estimates are a little bit more un uh, a little bit less uncertain, so the blue area has uh, shrinked, and also in the long run now our policy is a little bit better in terms of our optimal policy where we know, okay, here we wanted to wait, so probability one, here we wanted to cut, probability zero, and here in the third set we also wanted to cut, so probability zero. And compared to the previous uh, slide, we see that our, um, that our actions or our mean actions over the 2000 independent runs are going a little bit more in the right direction if we compare these two. And then as a last comparison, we have, oh no, not as a last, as a, a pre-last comparison, we again uh, made Zaza a little bit smaller again. So 
uh, more or less same observation here again so the policies are a little bit shifted in the long run to the optimal policy uncertainty is reduced and we can even uh, improve that more when we apply an adaptive Zaza here with one over the square root of our number of episodes so we will stay start with rather high alphas uh, for Zaza in the first couple of episodes in order to foster fast training and then reduce alpha over the time in order to um, yeah, reduce the uncertainty and also reduce our steady state errors and therefore we can also see that in the long run this uncertainty is more or less completely vanished and the only difference which we have between our uh, real optimal policy and our own policy Zaza policy here is that uh, we are still working with a constant epsilon of 0.2 so if we would have combined these two adaptive uh, implementations here so adaptive Zaza with adaptive epsilon greedy we could even improve our performance a little bit more so with these examples of uh, Zaza so on policy control for temporal difference methods in mind we now want to go one step yeah let's say further or another step uh, into the off policy domain and uh, for temporal difference this is called q learning and q learning is basically very similar to zaza we only have uh, one simple difference or one simple modification and that is that we don't take the state action pair of the successor state and the policy according to that successor state but we take the max out of that action value being in the successor state so and therefore we nicely combine a greedy update step with or greedy policy update step uh, within equation 5.12 the rest is completely the same as Zaza, but uh, we evaluate then our state estimate Q hat and take the max out of that. And this is an uh, off policy update because uh, yeah, we apply here the max and not the specific policy which would apply to XK plus one. So therefore due to that max operator, uh, we are yeah, being in an off policy fashion here requirements for q learning that it works because we are in off uh, learning regime again we need average so any uh, behavior policy which is used to uh, operate with uh, q learning has to be coverage in terms of that the behavior policy is um, having non-zero probability of selecting actions that might be taken by the target policy pi which we want to optimize here and therefore again the consequence is that the behavior policy has to be soft and uh, also for optimal state estimates here action uh, estimates we need to apply our step size requirements for alpha so to start with large alphas and then continuously decrease alpha for an uh, infinite number of samples the implementation of q-learning and this uh, makes uh, q-learning a very competitive and also well-known reinforcement learning technique is very simple so compared to the other implementation which was on policy now we are using uh, that off policy uh, variant here is even simpler so initialization and everything or going through the episodes going through the samples uh, through the state uh, steps uh, is pretty much the same uh, of QLearning compared to temporal difference learning and now as I said the only difference is here that our update is according to the max of the action value and not a specific sample of xk plus one and uk plus one but here the max and yeah so again also as we have discussed last week with Monte Carlo due to the avoidance of on policy uh, epsilon greedy steps we somehow avoid that exploration optim uh, exploration uh, exploitation dilemma of uh, on policy methods and uh, also which is a very nice feature of q learning if you remember the uh, importance sampling and weighted importance sampling based methods from last week for monte carlo control which somehow added complexity to the off policy uh, updates for monte carlo uh, control are not present here so we have this very simple 
implementation for the um, new value updates for a greedy policy, greedy target policy. And that's it. So this is uh, a very simple implementation and we don't need any additional um, mapping in terms of uh, mapping the behavior policy to the target policy as we needed it for Monte Carlo control. So very simple technique here. And I would like to compare the two algorithms using the cliff walking example, which is depicted here in figure 5.14. The cliff walking task is again a grid world based task. So an agent starts at a specific starting tile and it should travel to a specific goal tile. The problem here is that there are some states which are highlighted here in a gray color which we call the cliff states and anytime the agent is entering this cliff state it will be transferred back to the starting state starting position and will also get a penalty of minus 100 reward points so uh, really a problem here and yeah for every time step the an uh, agent is inside the environment it gets a negative reward of minus one and therefore it's denoted that the uh, agent should finish that task as fast as possible. We don't operate with discounting and this is important here, epsilon greedy um, or epsilon is set to 0.1. And as we can see here for a couple of episodes that at the beginning, both methods, Zaza and Q learning are equally learning fast. However, in the long run, we see that Q learning is performing worse than Zaza. And how can that come? basically these two questions you maybe pause that video for a second and think for yourself so basically the two questions here are directly related to each other so what performance is shown here in particular the answer to that is it's the training performance so in this case we um, have q learning with a behavior policy which is operating at epsilon greedy point one and zaza as on policy also has of course yeah, epsilon greedy choices for itself and in the training of course we have these random choices so if the agent is running at the at the cliff line then there might be the problem that at some certain situation the agent picks a random choice and that random choice could be inside to, to go inside the cliff right so in this case this uh, training with exploratory actions will of course in average reduce the q learning a reward uh, per episode and this is of course a big problem and um, the the q learning approach because it's using that max operator so this is addressing the second question why is Sasa better so due to the max operator it is really like a risk taker right uh, it somehow figured out at some learning point that staying here at the cliff just going one step uh, north staying there near the cliff going east and then uh, meeting the goal state is the quickest of course that is also the quickest if i'm not providing any exploratory random steps so this figure here would look a little bit different um, if i am switching off all random choices so therefore it's important to note that this figure here denotes the training performance and not some kind of a test performance validation performance where I would switch off the exploration random steps. And because uh, Sasa doesn't take any X operator inside its Q value update, but only the sampled Q value updates of the next state and the uh, successor action in that su successor state, uh, it's deciding to go for a uh, safer pass and therefore really uh, ensuring or not ensuring, but trying to minimize the likelihood of falling off the clip and with that strategy Sasa also um, achieves better results here compared to Q learning. But again it should be noted this is for training performance if we observe the performance in validation where the of course the our greedy choices would apply and not the uh, epsilon greedy choices then Q learning as we can imagine here is performing better so with that example uh, and q learning we are more or less done we have the three big points for today simple difference prediction on policy 
control of policy control and what will follow now are two extensions two interesting extensions to Zaza as well as to Q-learning which is double learning in order to uh, minimize the so-called maximization bias but first start with expected Zaza so expected Zaza is more or less the same as we have uh, used in, in normal Zaza also Q-learning but again our target is changing a little bit our update target and now as the name already suggests we are using the expected action value and therefore we will consider all possible actions being in a successor state xk plus one having a certain policy pi and that expected SASA uh, action value update uh, is a hybrid approach on the one hand because uh, we are using here the expectation together with a sampled based update uh, in terms of that successor state xk plus one is sampled however the source on how to get to xk plus one and how to get uk that can be an off off po uh, on policy regime right so um, if i'm going on policy for example using epsilon greedy then uk and the transition to xk plus one would come from an on policy domain and expected the other would be considered an on policy update if on the other hand working with a second behavior policy b which is giving me this trans, uh, transitions while i'm trying to estimate here on my uh, target policy pi then it would be an off policy update so with expected the other i can implement both variants right away so if we characterize expected Zaza, we can state that it, due to the uh, yeah, expectation update here, it moves deterministically in the same direction as the regular Zaza moves an expectation. Therefore, it's also called expected Zaza. It's of course a little bit more complex than ex uh, the vanilla Zaza because we have to evaluate here the entire uh, policy, especially if that uh, is a yeah, complex stochastic policy. We have to evaluate here a lot, and this is computational. Uh, costly however as we are not using single few transitions uh, in standard zaza but the entire expectation here we normally also reduce the variance a lot and as a special case if as i said we are using it in the off policy domain and applying here a complete greedy policy to pi and using an exploratory uh, policy for the off policy uh, exploration steps so for example in soft policy b then expected zaza can also become q learning because here that uh, yeah expectation would be then the max operator over our uh, state action pair in the time step k plus one so therefore expected zaza can be somehow considered as a generalization over q learning if you compare then the three backup diagrams of the considered update rules Zaza, QLearning, expected Zaza, we see some commonalities so all use sampled updates we just try to solve an MDP prediction and control problems by simple samples and a one step look ahead and as we are using an estimate in order to back up the previous state action or um, state value estimate we are also bootstrapping the distinctions are then uh, in terms of the update rule so Zaza just is based on specific state action transitions so these very uh, very shallow updates Q-learning is using the max operator uh, between the uh, action state and action update and expected Zaza as a generalization is not required to use the max operator but can plug in any specific policy pi here which should be evaluated if you compare these two uh, these three algorithms sasa q learning uh, expected sasa uh, against each other on the cliff walking example again for the training with epsilon point one we can uh, yeah see these results here this graphic here is somehow information rich we can see is the result for the so-called interim performance and asymptotic performance which translates to that the interim performance uh, is the average performance over the first 100 episodes so somehow the early stage performance of learning and the asymptotic performance translate to the average over the first 100,000 episodes 
with additional averaging over 50,010 runs. So this is in the, let's say, uh, late stage performance. Now, what we can see here is basically yeah, two information or two takeaway messages. The first takeaway message is that for the uh, early performance, for the interim performance, having a high alpha will translate to fast learning. Uh, so this was an observation we already made before. And then in the long run, we see especially for the standard Zaza, for the vanilla Zaza, that having a small uh, alpha vector, as we also discussed with the convergence probability or convergence property of temporal difference, we need that small alpha and ideally an alpha which is then in the limit going to zero. So for example, that one over alpha rule or one over k rule, this will help our uh, Sasa in order to converge well. Expected Sasa doesn't have that problem on the asymptotic performance due to that uh, yeah, expected update. And Q learning, as we have discussed with the uh, cliff walking example again, uh, as it uses that max operator, it's somehow the risk taker here. And uh, under training uh, circumstances, it is not as good as the regular Sasa or expected Sasa. So these are the takeaway messages here of the cliff, cliff walking example again for different update rules for interim performance or for early stage performance, asymptotic performance, late stage performance. And an additional bullet point I would like to discuss is the so-called maxima, maximization bias and double learning is a technique in order trying to reduce that maximization bias. What is it? So the maximization bias translate to the problem that in all of the control algorithms which we have implemented, so Q-learning, SASA, there is a maximization operation. So for Q-learning it was uh, very obviously, so we have the target policy update which is greedy in terms of the, um, in terms of the target and there the max operator is applied. And in Zaza, we have normally also a max operator, uh, which is in the case of an on policy epsilon greedy framework, also, of course, uh, involving when we uh, do our policy improvement step, which we didn't discuss in, in detail today. But as you remember from the previous uh, lectures, that this max operator then in the epsilon greedy framework is also present. Of course, it's not full greedy, but epsilon greedy, but there's also that max operator. So what is the problem with that? The problem is that uh, this can lead to significant positive bias. So we overestimating our state values or our here specifically action values. So if I'm having, for example, only a limited number of sampled values, uh, an estimated quantity, then these max operators will shift that estimates towards positive values towards positive numbers and this is called a maximization bias and we can illustrate this with a very small example so consider you only have a single state which uh, action value should be estimated and in general the true action value would be zero of that uh, state for all possible actions and what we do is we will sample a couple of times out of that uh, process and of course, um, as these samples are somehow uncertain, we have a random distribution, uh, maybe with mean zero, but some of these uh, drawn samples here will be of course below and some will be above zero. And now if we apply either epsilon greedy or full greedy max operations, uh, we will of course then shift that estimate towards positive values. So because we will take the specific sample out of this sample set which has had the highest action value and this uh, is of course a problem and can slow down the learning as we will see also later in an example. The idea to counteract this maximization bias problem is so-called double learning and in the double learning approach we are uh, trying to divide our sampled experience, so our uh, state action transitions into two sets and use them to estimate two independent action value functions, Q1 
and Q, uh, Q2. And uh, we use both uh, estimates, Q1 and Q2, in order to follow specific tasks. So for example, we could use Q1 in order to estimate the maximization action. So just a classical greedy choice. We are in a specific state and we're trying to find our best possible action. And then we know U star. And then we can plug in this information. So this arc max over Q1 in our second independent estimate Q2 in order to estimate the corresponding value. So of x uh, u star and therefore we have uh, somehow separated the problem of the uh, arc, max, arc max operator here and the estimate of the co corresponding state action pair. However, as we will see also on the next slide, we uh, of course double the memory requirement because we have two independent sets of action uh, value estimates but as we will see also in the next slide, that the computation per step remains the same. So we don't have to do any extra computation. But the WQ learning algorithm is then depicted here. So initialization is somehow standard. We need again an epsilon parameter if we are operating with a uh, soft behavior policy. We have our learning TD learning parameter alpha. We need some initializations now we need two initializations for q1 q2 we operate inside our environment so we get actions being in some states and these actions being in states can be done for example by uh, epsilon greedy choices based on q1 plus q2 so we can do some some ensemble building here then from that uh, epsilon greedy uh, choice we can take an action uk and observe LK plus one, XK plus one. And then basically what is happening here with uh, taking a random uh, number and try to uh, see if that is below or above zero. So this is basically splitting up in a random fashion the experience, right? So in 50% the cases, random cases, we will update according to this rule. In this case, we will use Q1 in order to find the best possible action. And in 50% the cases we will uh, use K, uh, Q2 in order to find the best possible actions and then the other um, the other uh, vice versa the other uh, state uh, action value estimate is updated so basically this is just splitting up our experience and we also have here a little example for that um, the environment is shown here on the right hand side so again we have two states state A state B State A is, uh, we have two actions. We can either go right, get, get a non-positive reward of zero and terminate the episode, or we can go left. We again get an instantaneous reward of zero. Then we are in state B. And from state B, there is a random yeah, process, a random probability uh, of going uh, yeah, also in the terminate state. But the reward we will get from that transition from state B to a termination is a random a number, a random process with mean of minus 0.1 and a standard deviation of 1. So basically, if you're looking on that MDP here, we could easily figure out, okay, because in mean, in the long run, having a negative reward of minus 0.1 is, of course, worse compared starting in state A and always going right and terminating because then in average of course we would have reward and a return of zero. However if we apply that environment that MDP problem with an uh, epsilon greedy factor of uh, 0.5 and uh, 0.1 to learning we will see that we have this problem here that new learning at the beginning so at the early stage learning uh, will sample some uh, random transitions here from B to termination which were much better than the average of that random process here, right? So with the standard deviations there might be some uh, rewards which were plus 0.5, plus 0.6 and so on. And due to the max operation and Q learning that estimate of the state 
value and also of the action value here was heavily disturbed. And then over time, Q-learning is able to counteract on that to see, okay, I'm getting more samples, more samples. I can correct my overestimation by the bias maximization problem, but this really needs some time. And the WQ learning, which splits the experience in order to split up maximization and estimation uh, tasks, is much more robust and can learn quicker from the very beginning. So we can see that in uh, the long run, we will see that with epsilon greedy of uh, 0 0.1, uh, in the best case, we have 5% minimum probability by epsilon greedy to be enforced to take the left actions. But in general, we can see that uh, WQ learning very nicely converges to that bound and therefore always uh, will try to go right. So here, this simple example then highlights that in certain situations where that maximization bias problem can occur, WQ learning can be fruitful in order to make the learning more robust, especially again in the early stage. And with this final example, I would like to conclude our today's lecture with a summary. So we have learned that temporal difference methods are uniting the two characteristics, key characteristics of dynamic programming and Monte Carlo. We have sample-based updates um, operating in an unknown MDP in the Monte Carlo case, and we are doing bootstrapping from dynamic programming. This led to certain simplifications and improvements compared to Monte Carlo approaches because we don't have to wait until the entire episodes uh, end. We can do a step-by-step -step updates and uh, we only have this one step delay when uh, doing TD0 update. In particular, also off-policy learning uh, was a little bit tedious with Monte Carlo approaches. We needed that important sampling mapping, which is not required now for temporal difference learning approaches. So that makes the implementation much more straightforward. And we have seen that when applying batch learning, that in steady state, reapplying that batch data information, that uh, temporal difference learning is using the uh, formal MDP structure by bootstrapping approach and therefore leads to maximum likelihood estimate, which is often a preferred estimate compared to the least squared estimate uh, in the Monte Carlo case. And yeah, summarizing these um, advantages of temporal difference compared to Monte Carlo, we can uh, see that in practice, uh, comparing Monte Carlo methods and temporal difference method, that uh, this really leads to a high applicability of temporal difference compared to Monte Carlo. Of course, especially in continuing tasks because uh, Monte Carlo is not applicable there. Yeah, batch learning, uh, we already shortly discussed, is uh, a good idea if we only have limited experience. Of course, we have to take into account that all our convergence statements are just applicable to an infinite number of samples. But if we have only a limited number of experience available, then batch learning can be a suitable idea in order to squeeze out the maximum amount of information out of that data. And uh, we have learned with the final uh, example that greedy policy improvements, which are present in the on and off policy variants of temporal difference control, can lead to maximization biases, and this can slow down the learning progress. However, we have learned that with double learning, WQ learning, we can try to counteract for that. And we have a new, uh, or not new, but we have discussed in detail two uh, important tuning factors. So in general for TD learning, we have the step size or learning factor or forgetting factor alpha. So we have to um, tune that very carefully. So here the take a message, take away message was to maybe start with uh, higher values and then reduce alpha over time in order to uh, learn fast in the beginning and then learn accurate in the end. And of course, we again have discussed the exploration exploitation dilemma. So how to tune the um, exploration random moves in order to visit all state action pairs such that we can 
find a truly optimal policy. So this problem, the exploration, exploitation dilemma, of course, also applies to temporal difference as it also did for Monte Carlo approaches. And with this final words, I would like to close the today's lecture on temporal difference learning. I hope you have obtained some new and interesting knowledge for you. And I thank you for your kind attention and wish you a pleasant week. See you soon.